Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. It's Bernadine McLeod. I am the president and founder of MentorWorks, and um, as a leader in the government funding space, we're co-hosting today's session with the Internet of Things company, and we want to talk about data analytics and predictive indicators and um, and how the services of Internet of Things could potentially be government funded based on all the new trends in the automotive and aerospace um, market segments. So we're just going to wait another uh, three to four minutes and then we will go live with today's event. And uh, we do expect it to run um, approximately 45 to 60 minutes. So we'll be back to you very shortly. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, my name is Bernadine McLeod and I'm the president of MentorWorks and uh, who we are is a government funding private company located just outside of Toronto, Ontario. And our goal this morning is to co-host an information and education session with a leading partner in uh, artificial intelligence looking at um, predictive maintenance and uh, looking at data analytics and how that can improve productivity improvements in manufacturing operations um, serving the automotive, aerospace and the defense industry is the primary industry targets for today's session. So we're co-hosting today with Internet of Things. They um, are located in the US uh, just outside of Ohio um, but they have offices here in Canada and uh, what we hope to do is to provide some um, educational support on how you get started in this space of addressing big data issues, but you must start small. So our goal is um, to allow uh, the Internet of Things company to proceed and they'll start the, the webinar today share some case study information and some optimal approaches. And today's session is going to be led by um, uh, Dr. Mo. He's the managing partner and CEO of the Internet of Things company. And um, as a leader, he's really um, a strong strategic and transformative technology uh, approach to this industry segment with over 20 years of experience about sustaining that change and implementing the technology that's required. So um, I'm not going to uh, take any um, of the thunder away from the case studies and his approach, but it really starts about using uh, predictive analytics and sorting through your data available to you. 
following his um, uh, sharing his presentation with you, then I'll follow it with some of the top leading government funding programs in Ontario and show you what the government would want you to be aware of and how you receive assistance support um, through government grant programs to encourage you to accelerate your adoption of uh, this digital um, technology approach that's available to us all. So at this point, I will comment. Um, if you have any audio, um, please um, uh, look at um, uh, these solutions in front of you to help you troubleshoot uh, locally. If you still have problems, don't hesitate to email matt at mentorworks.ca and Matt will um, help you through it. For the time being, the protocol of today's webinar is that we've muted everybody, but we have a question uh, chat session open, and my colleague Sarah will respond to as many of the questions as, as she can throughout the webinar. Otherwise, our goal is that Mo and I will answer and address any of your frequently asked questions at the end of today's webinar. So please don't hesitate to ask, and if we can respond to them as we're doing the webinar, we'll certainly try to do so. Um, so this is the agenda for today, um, really looking at um, the Industrial 4.0 advancements that have been made and making sure that you're aware of some of the top resources. So at this point, um, Mo, I'll turn it over to uh, one of your colleagues, uh, James Ritchie. And James, I'll let you address the group and uh, discuss your path forward. Thanks, Bernadine. So good morning, everyone. Just quick uh, check. Hopefully everybody can see my screen OK. Um, excellent. So what I'd like to do is, uh, first off, is just give you a little uh, introduction. And thanks again, Bernadine, for and MentorWorks for kind of hosting this webinar today. So as a short introduction, my name is James Ricci. I'm a uh, senior advisor actually to IoT company, and my background by trade is an engineer, um, but I've spent really my whole career focused in and around operations and manufacturing. And so Mo and I um, are really excited today to kind of share with you a little bit about um, digital transformation and the requirements, the business case, the roadmap to kind of, to, you know, the tools required to kind of take, take you there for your business. So I'm gonna sort of set the stage here for a bit and really talk about the why this is occurring and why this is happening. Um, I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes on that. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Mo, as Bernadine mentioned, turn it over to Mo to kind of follow up with the how, right? So he's gonna really get into the case studies, the examples, um, and then Bernadine's, like I said, she's gonna wrap that up with the, with the funding opportunities. So now before we dive in, let me at least give you the, the one slide on, you know, who is IoT company and, you know, kind of what we do. And the, you know, I guess if I was to simply put it, we're, 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 a, team of, we're a team of manufacturing consultants, we're industry data scientists, and we're, you know, the internet of thing type of engineers. And we're really focused on making sure you and your team have the best information available to you. It's really that concept of a smart factory, if you will, okay? And so our focus, um, has been and continues to be then this this idea that you know we're we're focused on this taking this smart factory and really applying it to the idea of a zero downtime zero defect vision for manufacturing and we've really proved that kind of mindset out this zero downtime zero defect mindset with some of the companies that you see listed here as as, as our clients and um and so we've really built this out of automotive. So automotive, I would say, is core to us. It's, our, it's in our DNA. Yet we've absolutely scaled this into other verticals that Bernadine, Bernadine mentioned, right? Aerospace and others that we've kind of built out this whole concept of a digital transformation strategy. And in fact, um, we've, we've taken this and really even embedded it further into what I'm going to call like smart products, right? So for, you know, we've got a smart factory, but we've also got some more products to go and talk about thinking, thinking, uh, excuse me, thinking about stuff like remote monitoring or diagnostic of critical equipment right out in the field. So think about smart pumps and smart gearboxes, all of those things that we're thinking about, again, zero defects, you know, high uptime, that's what we're kind of focused on. So what I want to do is 
we want to take that and 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 expand on that and we want to talk about how these services can be used kind of in this day and age so before we dive in though um what i'd like to do is just again set it up i'm going to do a little bit of setting the stage mo's going to take over on the connectivity and metrics and analytics side and then i'm we're going to move forward into bernity so first slide it's a little busy um but you hear this term iot a lot internet of things what exactly does that mean um you know in short iot internet of things is really just about smart devices that can collect and exchange data over a network or over the internet without really any kind of human intervention so that's kind of the big picture of what iot is now industrial iot is really a subset of this and those are you know usually what i would call more internally focused within the four walls of your factory so what you're looking at there is the left side of this screen where it talks about the industrial side and these industry 4.0 tools which i'll talk about on the next slide are definitely part of this system for the uh, industrial internet of things so as you look at this and you go okay what is the whole what it makes up iiot it's this triangle that you see here right so you're looking and thinking about at that base level all of your equipment at the base of this pyramid so that's all of your equipment that's all of the the plcs and all the controllers that go with them right and that machine layer builds up and it's aggregated and controlled through some kind of perhaps a SCADA system and or an mes system a manufacturing execution system right and all of this data and information then ultimately is boiled up into the ERP system, right? Your enterprise resource planning system, if that, you know, assuming they have one, and that interacts sort of with finance and purchasing and all the larger systems within your organization. And then select portions of each one of these, ERP, MES, SCADA, they in fact not only communicate internally, right, but they communicate externally out to the external environment through with your customers. Um, your uh, suppliers etc right so we've got all of this and and so from a nuts and bolts perspective you know a implementation of an industrial internet of approach to the business um really rests on a on a transformation around the four pillars that you the four main items that you see below technology analytics connectivity and a return on investment and these kind of four key pillars is what's required to support what you're seeing above it and mo is actually going to walk through each of these in a little bit of detail with those case studies so i don't want to steal any of his thunder but we're going to walk through these in in great detail so that you understand what's required to sort of set forth this transformation so as we build this out though um i kind of got into a little bit of detail on the industrial internet of things but um i want to back up a little bit and talk about that that orange circle in the middle that industry right when you think about that you can see that it kind of straddles the internet of things and it also straddles that pyramid and and if you read those words erp mes machines you're thinking to yourself hey james those things have been around in manufacturing forever in a day and, and and you're right so really you know what ultimately makes industry 4.0 really any different than kind of what we've been doing all along and i really like this chart uh not so much for the history sake but for kind of what it what it entails with what what this all means kind of going forward and so when you look at this um industry 4.0 is really built off of the first three and i'm not going to go through the history of the first three but you the general thought process is hey we we had a manufacturing plant we had our first mechanical loom the second one would be something like henry ford's assembly line the moving assembly line in the 1920s and 30s uh, where that really took hold and then the third industrial revolution was in the 70s, early 70s, late 60s, where we really introduced PLCs and robots and things of that nature. But, but why I like this chart so much is what you see along the bottom, and it lays out some of the management processes and systems that have come along with this. And those two combined really create a very different situation as it relates to, to productivity. Excuse me, I think I lost my presentation here hold on one second there we go sorry so in this case when you look at what was accomplished when we started to introduce robots and plcs you can look along the left hand side there and you see the productivity 
corresponding increase in productivity. So as we brought in TQM, we bring in Lean and Six Sigma, we've seen an exponential increase in productivity on the shop floor. And something like the, four, the fourth industrial revolution, what they're calling here, um, is supposed to have an exponential impact on that. So when we talk about you know, this industry 4.0, it's really a term that came out of the German government. And it was really brought about to just talk and promote innovative manufacturing. And so it's now playing out more as this digitalization of the physical world and effectively this seamless integration of the two of the physical and the digital world. And so you end up with a factory that can self-optimize, it can self-configure, it can self-diagnose, it can self-schedule. And when you start thinking about how transformative that could be, you can see why your the expectation is there's going to be an exponential leap um, in efficiencies um, as these as these items reach reach scale. So the question is, they reach scale. Why? What what's what's happening today that is ultimately allowing this transition to accelerate? And, and I use the term transition, but what you see up there is the term implementation. I use that to kind of draw your eye to it. Implementation is probably a, is the wrong term because this is really a transition. It's not like I'm going to implement industry 4.0 and be done. It's more of a transition that's going to occur within your business. Now, why is that going to occur? It's for all the reasons that you see that are coming up on this slide. So I'm going to call your attention to a couple of things. Please don't underestimate the impact of your customer, right? So on the left-hand side there, you see pricing, quality, lead time pressures, all of those things um, coupled to significant advances in both software and hardware is really allowing this to be an enabler for all of these smart this smart equipment and for this ability for this to for this to happen and to get that exponential increase in in productivity okay but even more so today let's think about what else is going to accelerate this thing and we think about things like an evolving in a, comp a complex supply chain we don't have to look any further to the first six months of this year with everything that's going on with COVID to think about how those things are impacting, um, is gonna impact this transition and impact how companies do manufacturing, right? So, you know, for sure though, trying to get to industry 4.0 and begin this transition and figure out what is the best digital roadmap for yourself, there's definitely challenges that exist. And these challenges, really, which you see listed here, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but they're, they're there, and quite frankly, they've gotten, they've kind of been elevated. I kind of made that cool little uh, COVID virus there off to the left for you to see that this list of challenges that Mo and I have put together, some of those are were there prior to COVID, and they're, they're now even a larger issue due to COVID. So. From our perspective, as you look through these, um, we have to think about uh, the challenges that these exist, and especially the challenges that when you look at these, you want to think about these as a relation to people, technology, and process. So if you read through these, some of these are people challenges, right? Availability and aging skilled trades, new skill sets needed in the organization. Technology issues could be this, you know, your use, your outdated drivers and your software, or your dumb equipment, et cetera but all of these have to work together, right? And that's basically where you get into the challenge of, of beginning your digital road mapping, your, transfer, your transformation within your organization. It's when the three of these are really out of balance. So think about it as um, you've bought the latest and greatest, highest piece of technology out there, but you have cavemen running it, right? You're not gonna get the benefit of that state-of-the-art equipment if you don't have the people trained and up to speed on that, and you don't have processes aligned to leverage that 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 information. So all of these things have to work in in, in balance with each other. And and I'd be remiss if I didn't spend time talking about the last one on there, the access to capital or the ability to kind of reinvest in your business. It goes without saying that you know you need to be profitable to some degree here, because you have to reinvest back in your business, whether it's new equipment or new technology. And this is incredibly challenging in this day and age. Um, however, um, while we do have those challenges and it's a difficulty, actually 
developing a digital transformation and beginning that process, there's actually a significant ROI associated with this. And there's a very strong business case that you can develop to go and do this. So if we talk about just for a minute, the concept of a smart factory, and let's think about just equipment for a moment, and let's think about it in relation to OEE, overall equipment effectiveness. So we're talking about uptime, we're talking about quality, we're talking about availability of your equipment and the maintenance that goes with that, right? Um, you know, what if we operated in an environment where we're more proactive, both people-wise and equipment-wise? And what happens when we have, when we know our data is right, everyone on the factory floor has the right information at the right time to make the optimal decision at that moment, right? What you see are the numbers you see on the right. And honestly, these numbers um, you know, are what we've seen so far, but there's a lot more to be had on the table. And, and I, 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 wanna, I don't wanna underestimate for you, I wanna maybe overestimate for you, the benefit of a five to 10% gain in OEE. That is a massive number. When you couple that to a 15 to 25 percent improvement in labor productivity, what does that do for your business? Those gains create new capacity, both from a people perspective and from an equipment perspective, that can self fund a lot of new business opportunities that you can go after. So ultimately, the digital transformation needs to be tied in to the business plan of what you want to do, but the benefits that you get can absolutely self-fund a lot of the business and a lot of the revenue that's needed for the business to grow. So with that, what I'd like to do is the setup. I'm going to pass the baton over to Mo, and he's going to kind of walk through and highlight a lot of the uh, examples and case studies of how you do this and how to set up, ultimately set up that, uh, that transformational roadmap. Mo? Thank you, James. Thank you very much. Uh, you should be able to see my screen. And, uh, and thank you for setting the stage. And thank you, Bernadine and the MentorWorks team for, for hosting this because it's, it's a truly a crucial topic, uh, especially during these times, uh, on how to use digital tools um, in order to drive productivity. And as James said, a very strong business case uh, in any manufacturer, big or small. Um, so I, I'd like to start here. Um, James has has set the stage in a in a very fine way, and you know to achieve the business case um, that delivers the win for the manufacturer, uh, it is very important to understand where to start and how to start. And we uh, through IoTco, um, working with MentorWorks, uh, we have an assessment approach to help any industry to understand how to start and how to deploy these digital tools in a phase approach. But before I talk about the assessment, I'd like to um, give a high level understanding uh, on four or five key areas. OK, I'd like to introduce first off the foundation. How do you get connected? How do you collect data? Second, what do you do with the data in terms of metrics? So James mentioned OEE as a key metric to drive manufacturing efficiency. I'd like to uh, give an example of, of how you can calculate OEE in real time. Third is execution in general, right? How can you tie information from the plant floor to your planning system, your business system, or your enterprise resource planning system? And last but not least, what else can you do with the data? How can you use advanced analytics to predict future performance of your machines and your assets on the factory floor? And then I'll conclude with what is the assessment approach that we follow to help uh, industries today select the right tools and deploy the right tools in a phase approach. So let's start with the foundation. And the foundation is data. Uh, some say data is the new oil. Um, data is key uh, to drive IoT initiatives and to drive continuous improvement initiatives. And when I say data, I am talking about real time data collected from the factory floor. We go in and we ask several questions. We, we do tours, we do surveys, we, we clearly need to understand the status and the level of readiness of the machines and the assets on the factory floor. Um, keeping in mind, some machines are new with, with ethernet ports that can spit out data. Some machines are, are quite old, antiquated. They're still making good parts. 
uh, but yet it is very difficult to connect to those machines, right? So at the end of the day, it's all about the readiness level of the machines in terms of its networking capability. How long is it going to take us to connect and how much and how much data are we able to capture from that machine, depending on the age of the machine? So we've we've as part of our assessment process, we've come up with a an audit procedure, which is part of the digital transformation assessment that we provide. And this audit procedure is really four pillars or four steps. Um, we we have a senior automation engineer that takes a very close look at the assets. We look at the asset in terms of its readiness to connect to the network. And if the machine is fairly old, uh, usually we would require additional hardware that would be uh, embedded and, and connected to the machine. Uh, so we're also in the business of supporting manufacturers to connect hardware, uh, affordable hardware, to legacy machines that are not able to speak to the uh, to the outside world because of the age. Second is we work with the IT organization and the networking team within the factory to get that machine on the network. And once the machine is on the network with, a, with an IP address and it's able to talk, uh, we are able then to define a data map. So uh, I'm gonna show several use cases. One of the data maps is for example, OEE. So how can I capture OEE parameters from the CNC machine as an example? Um, you know, cycle starts, uh, piece counter, machine on, machine off, your e-stop signal, you know, anything that the operator touches on the machine controller is a, a data point that can be captured into a real-time data collection environment. And last but not least, we make that data available. We create a data lake, and this data lake is, is a standardized area database that can be accessed by multiple systems. It can be accessed by your OEE system, it can be accessed by your execution system, your ERP system, your maintenance system. And, and therefore, the ROI is, is huge here because you have collected now real-time data, real-time parameters from the machines, and you're able to now use that data to drive real-time metrics and real-time improvements on the factory floor. So machine data is key, connectivity is key on the factory floor. We also look at where do I get the data from? and what types of data I need to collect. I talked about use cases, right? So what are you trying to achieve? What is the business case? Back to James's presentation. Is it just measuring real-time OEE or am I using data to do statistical process control? For example, quality measurements. Am I monitoring process parameters on my injection molding machine like a, a temperature spike or a pressure spike which might lead to a machine issue or a part issue, right? Am I tracing parts? Do I need a birth certificate or a genealogy of the part as it, as it goes down my value stream? So define the use case, define the business case, and have that drive the type of data that needs to be acquired from the machine. Then we make the data available, as I mentioned, and there are many means to do that. There are you know, historians, there are data acquisition solutions. Um, you know, we, we work with the client to understand what is the best solution technically and cost-wise uh, that would satisfy their data collection requirements, and we set that up. And once we set that up, we integrate that solution to other systems, right? As I mentioned, you might have a maintenance system or a predictive system or an MES system. I I'm going to show some examples of those systems, right? So we, we are not in the business of ripping and replacing solutions you already have. We are in the business of assessing those solutions helping you make improvements and complement what you already have invested uh, in, in doing on your factory floor. Number two, metrics. So now that I have the data lake, what do I do with the data? The first thing that should be done with the data is driving real-time metrics that can be used by the right person at the right time to deliver uh, decision-making, okay? Accurate, accurate and precise decision-making. So we define two types of metrics. We define performance metrics and predictive metrics. A performance metric is like overall equipment effectiveness. It is telling you your performance now on the machine, in the factory, or in multiple factories. And it is a real-time metric and it is a historical metric. So you can have trends, your, your shift OEE, your per week, per day, per month, per year, right? It's a historical metric of your efficiency and performance. Whereas predictive metrics are futuristic metrics on when is this machine gonna fail? 
what is the remaining useful life that a spindle bearing on my CNC machine is going to go down so I can order a new bearing and I can reduce spare parts that I'm keeping in my inventory because now I know a heads up of when this machine is actually going to fail before it fails. So now a lot of folks are measuring productivity, which is great. You know, how many pieces, what's the yield, what's my cost, what's my overhead. But underneath the water, underneath the surface are digital metrics that we work with our clients to, to help them achieve by using data collected from the factory floor. So what is your true utilization today? How long has the machine actually ran? And why has the machine went down? What are the stoppage reasons? What's your performance? Uh, everybody has a business system like an ERP, and you know it takes 30 minutes to run that part. That's your standard cycle time. But has it really taken 30 minutes? Or have you taken 20 minutes, 5 minutes, 25 minutes, right? So what's the speed of running your parts? That's your performance. And lastly, what's your quality level? How many pieces are good? How many are, are scrap? How many are rework, if you have rework? And what is the reason for that, right? Why am I producing good parts and bad parts? And are there quality attributes and process control type of attributes like weight and dimension and, and temperatures that need to be collected, right? So digital metrics are key to drive real-time, actionable, precise uh, analytics on the factory floor. But nevertheless, some folks are measuring OEE today, but yet the machines fail, right? Or yet the machines start making a bad part. So how can I use predictive metrics? like the health of the machine and prediction of when the machine is going to fail and the reason, the true reason of failure. So I can have hindsight metrics like OEE, but also futuristic driving metrics like uh, asset prediction and, and life and diagnostics, right? So metrics are key to drive action. And this is an example. I would say there are, there are really four characteristics of a metric. A, it should be real time. Real time meaning you have intelligent machines, expensive machines on the factory floor. Those machines can speak, they can talk, and they deliver data, real time data. We capture that real time data to provide you real time metrics. Second, they should be integrated metrics from the plant floor to the top floor. There has to be an integration where you understand what is the true runtime of my part, what is the true setup time, what is the true labor time. And why have I had downtime during the run of my part? For example, in this case, um, did I have a tool change? Uh, did I consume a raw material? Did I report a fuse has been changed? You see there's an example here, right? And it's important to be able to present that information to the right person at the right time so it can be accessed from anywhere within your network, of course, it's your data, and anytime, right? On a cell phone, on a web browser, it should, be, it should have that capability, this IT capability, to help you uh, access the data at any time and make use of the data at any time. And then it should be standardized and enterprise-wide. Once you prove it on several machines, you should be able to scale it to the plant, or you should be able to scale it to multiple plants if, if you have a multi-site operation. Then you have execution. Um, it doesn't just stop at OEE, right? You have production things that you need to do with digital tools. You have inventory related items, quality, maintenance, right? So the MESA organization, the Manufacturing Execution Society organization, they have come up with a four-pronged uh, four approach to deliver execution on the factory floor by using IT solutions to integrate machine level data and business ERP level data, right? And here's an example, right? When you're looking at production operations, you're looking at OEE, that's an integral part of that. But you're also looking at scheduling, right? Finite capacity scheduling. You're also looking at tracking labor on the factory floor. When you're looking at inventory, you're looking at traceability, genealogy, birth certificates of the part. You might have a, a, your OEM calling you, telling you, um, I have an issue on batch number X. You need to be able to trace that batch back to every machine and every person who was part of the production of that batch. That's traceability for, for mitigating warranty and recall issues. You have quality, right? We talked about SPC, doing quality checks, monitoring the process, but also things like supplier complaints, concerns, customer complaints, CPK, gauge analysis, right? That's all part of quality. Even visual defect quality. We have clients that where the operators see the part and they touch a screen to inform the solution that, hey, I have an issue on, on this hinge or on the specific torque, right? So visual quality and visual defects are also 
uh, very important for the for the connected worker. Then you have maintenance, right? Um, I, I'm collecting process data, but my my machines might fail. I need a spare part management system. Um, I need to manage my tools, right? I need to know what is the tool wear and the tool life on my machine. Um, I'm collecting process data. I want to be an energy efficient facility. I want to reduce my power consumption, air consumption, water consumption, right? So it is not just about OEE metrics, but once you evolve the digital maturity of the organization, you're able to start using other manufacturing execution type of functionality. And it's important to, to help you find a solution where it is A, affordable and ROI based. Second, it can be deployed quickly using templates. And templates, and, and there are a lot of solutions today that we work with that have templates where these features here can be deployed fairly quickly. And lastly, we talk about analytics, right? That's kind of the, the holy grail. Um, so now you have metrics. Now you're executing, you're doing better scheduling, better costing, right? How about a worry-free manufacturing process? How about predictive capability? Using that data lake, your asset data, your process data, your quality data, which good news you already have in your data lake, but now you don't wanna just use it to report metrics. You wanna apply mathematics and analytics and algorithms and artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? In order to predict future issues on the machine, but not just that, also predict future issues on your part. So we talk about predictive maintenance, which is focusing on the machine itself and the critical components within the machine. But we also talk about predictive quality, which is focusing on the part you're producing and how the machine data may correlate to a defect on the part itself. We have clients, for example, that have a casting process or an injection molding process where scrap rates may be a bit higher than normal. And by using analytics, you're able to start correlating historical data of the machine parameters and the part parameters. And you can actually make predictions on the fly that are quite accurate, you know, 90 to 95% accurate, informing the operator, hey, this part is going to be a bad part. It is a suspect part. Please pull it off the machine and inspect it, you know, before shipping it to the customer or going to the next process and then the price of that part you know just exponentially increases right um, so it's it's important to think about using your data lake in a in a in a new way to predict machine issues and to predict quality issues on your parts and we understand every manufacturer is different just like the maturity level of every manufacturer may be different but the core processes in manufacturing today have similarities you have robotics, you have machine tools, CNCs and casting, um, your injection molding, you have stamping presses, and you have ancillary equipment. This is all the critical components surrounding the factory, like your compressors and motors and pumps and so on. You know, predictive maintenance or predictive analytics does not have to be factory or enterprise wide. But if you select the right processes that are most critical to the operation, from an uptime maintenance perspective or from a quality scrap perspective, as James was saying, a zero downtime, zero defect vision, you're able to deploy some of these quickly deployable, affordable templates in order to help you with better maintenance, better spare parts, better quality and defect detection on your machines. So this is part of the assessment to also understand what are the critical processes that the manufacturer has that may be eligible for a predictive analytics type of approach. And again, it does not have to be the whole factory, but we should be selective on where to start. And this is how it's done, actually. Predictive analytics and data science has become very mature in the past years. Um, I used to work at Toyota. We used to do predictive maintenance uh, 15 years ago, actually, in Georgetown, Kentucky. And a lot of these solutions and the know-how we have actually comes from those days. So we're, we're talking about using the data lake, processing that data, extracting statistics and metrics from that data, and then delivering machine learning and, and algorithms that understand what's the true health of the machine and what is a prediction, of course, with an accuracy of when this machine might fail before it fails. So moving from a reactive time-based maintenance approach to a proactive, predictive, preventive maintenance approach. This process is, is available, predefined, proven 
in 25, 30 different predictive analytics templates that we work with uh, all the time. This is how a solution may look like, actually. And the reason I'm showing this is just to paint the picture that you don't need your maintenance department to be a PhD or a data scientist. The maintenance folks, they're good at maintaining machines. So they need a user experience, an intuitive user experience, where they can very quickly understand, oh, my machine was healthy. My machine started to degrade. I hit warning. I just received a, a predictive alert on my cell phone. And here's my prediction window. OK, I got to order a spare part here before the, before the failure happens. And right here, this is the type of spare part I need to order. I need to order my bearing, my SKF bearing, for access number five, joint five on my robot, for example. Right. So quick, intuitive. You don't need to be a PhD or a data scientist. And, and the same for OEE solutions, MES solutions, predictive solutions. The role of people, right? As James said, people process technology, the role of people and how intuitive those solutions should be for people to use is crucial to the success of a digital transformation strategy. So let's conclude and, and talk about how do we do an assessment today, knowing that there's so many tools out there. There is a data lake. There is OEE, connectivity, analytics, great stuff. But you know, how do I know how mature I am, how ready I am for these tools, and how can I deploy them in a phase approach? It all starts here. Again, taking back the slide that James showed right in the beginning of the deck. We need to assess your maturity on four pillars. Your business case, how connected you are, what type of analytics you're using today, and what type of technology you should select based on a cost benefit analysis, okay? And to do this, we need to analyze these four layers within your operation. We need to look at the readiness of your machines, your data acquisition, your execution and scheduling layer, and your enterprise resource planning layer, okay? And the way we do it today is a three-step approach, and it starts with an assessment, which is part of a proof of value, okay? It goes into a template and training a center of excellence within your organization, and then rollout, okay, which can be performed by yourself. We would like to enable your manufacturing organization to do it yourself. Busy slide, but I only want to focus here. This is an assessment. It's a three-day effort conducted by a senior, a senior manufacturing consultant, conducted by an automation engineer who understands the controls on the factory floor, and a data scientist who understands analytics. Three resources, three days. The goal here is to clearly align expectations and assess your gaps on the machine layer, data acquisition layer, MES scheduling, and predictive layer, okay? To understand the readiness and the maturity level of the organization and to make recommendations of this is your as is state today, this is your to be state, and this is a phase approach, one, two, three, to make that happen, okay? Here's some examples of those deliverables. What's your readiness level? I'm gonna show an example of that. What is a recommended technology roadmap? You know, what do we recommend you do today to get connected if you're not, to collect better data, to execute and schedule better, and to do uh, planning better? What is a design spec to execute that if you are interested to go to the next step, which is your execution, the actual pilot? And then how can you roll that out? And very important here, what is the people side of the equation, right? What are the training requirements and change management and culture process requirements that should be put in place? And most importantly, at the end of the day, this is your business case and ROI justification, right? It makes sense. The numbers dictate that it makes sense for you to invest or to you know, work with our mental works partners to, to get the funding needed to make it happen. And how do you manage that project, right? Team, scope, timeline, cost. This is just an example of such a three-day agenda. You know, we, we honor everyone's time. We understand people's time is extremely valuable. So we have a very efficient agenda with breakout sessions to make the three days uh, value add to the whole organization, right? Um, so I leave this here in the presentation that we're gonna share with, uh, with the audience. And at the end of the day, you need to understand what is your readiness scale. And we define readiness on five levels, starting at a lower technical and organizational level of readiness, where you need to start getting connected and training and, and, and leading to awareness. We, we, cl we clearly respect that some organizations may still be in this area. 
Visibility, now I have data, I'm visible, I have metrics. Efficiency, I'm using those metrics. I might start to do some execution, SPC, quality type of approach. Advanced analytics, I'm tapping into my data lake and I'm doing more. I'm predicting maintenance issues or maybe predicting defect issues. And last but not least, I am transformation ready. And we'll show you here is where you are today in a very honest, unfiltered feedback. And this is why we think you are here today. These are the technical and organizational attributes that allows us to believe that you are here today in terms of digital maturity or digital readiness. And lastly, those are the tools we recommend you deploy. And this is why you should deploy them and how you should deploy them, okay? So this assessment is key. And this assessment is something we are uh, working with MentorWorks strategically uh, to fund through some Canadian government opportunities. And uh, uh, Bernadine uh, would love to have you give some insights on some of those funding opportunities to support the assessment. Thank you. Well, let's get started. Um, over the next few minutes, I really want to show you how the government is responding to those issues around digital transformation. And uh, I think it's best to go through the specific programs. Um, normally, we write 75 different products, and this is a little bit about us. We're located just outside of Toronto, and our average size grant is around $175,000. If it's a 0% loan product that we bring you, then uh, the average size loan is $2.4 million. But all of these projects are related around your investment priorities. So whether it's capital equipment or doing this um, assessment, consulting, execution work that Mo showed you what their approach is, there is funding to do that. So. And all of this funding stems from the government as priority areas. There's been a lot of reports, a lot of research work done on what is most similar on the top automotive companies that are growing in North America. And one of their strongest attributes that they have in common is their commitment to predictive analytics and digital transformation. So with those results and those research reports coming in, now you can see how both the federal and the provincial government is lining up funding in order to address those um, business challenges. So all I want to do today then is to talk about what the money would look like, what the funds look like. I'm going to give you the exact name of the program. Um, our role, our expertise, our value is in writing the application for you and preparing the budget, reviewing your quotes, doing the due diligence and staying by your side until you get government approval. But regardless, um, the most important priority for me today is to make sure that you understand what programs exist to help you accelerate your growth. And um, so when we start, there's about 210 programs in Ontario. The only way we've been able to make sense of them over the last 12 years of being in this space is to put them into four different buckets. So I want to walk you through what those um, top programs would look like to solve each of those challenges that you have today. So if you choose to do this work on your own, I would really encourage you to understand that when it comes to government funding, you have to focus on the fit of the program to your strategic project. So right away, you want to start understanding what are the timelines. And the timelines are um, based on what are the government timelines versus what is your business timelines. Um, probably the biggest trend that we've seen in the last 24 months is the government is opening more and more programs with intake deadlines of about eight to nine weeks. That makes it very hard for you to take advantage of these government programs unless you've done some of the assessment work up front and you've made a selection of your vendors and you understand what your proactive strategy should be. So be aware of the government timelines because a program may only come open three times a year. And then of course your timeline is, is when do you want to get started? 
Have you issued a deposit to the vendor of choice? And when do you want to take delivery on the equipment or the technology? That's going to impact the program that we select for you to use. Project expenses, I can't stress enough, and this has to do with our partnership with Internet of Things and working with Mo's team, is that some programs allow training and skills development. Other programs are only suited for the assessment phase. Other programs are suited um, for training exercises. So it's very important that you have a clear indication of what is the purpose and mandate of the program so that um, the quote aligns to the project and the program from the government that you're selecting. Um, impacts is really how the government is going to score your application. This is probably one of the greatest value that we'll offer to you in our conversations and in, in our selection of the programs and writing your file is discussing is it going to be heavily judged on sustaining jobs, incremental new jobs that you're able to provide? Is the program focused on operational excellence or is it focused on executive excellence? Uh, so some programs um, that I'll share with you shortly are really focused on how to help your operators with better key decision-making ability and it's not focused at all on providing better data to your executive team. They want to encourage you to impact um, the operators and the players on the floor. So here is a selection. I just put up a few in front of you. Um, really about focused on employee engagement is the trend that I'm seeing recently from the government and in some of the program selection um, that they're making, which really ties in so important to digital transformation is um, without the data, then how do the key operators um, make the decisions that are critical on the plant floor? So as I suggested, all of these programs are really sliced into these four um, themes of funding. And I just wanna run through some of our favorite programs in a very quick um, condensed way to ensure that you see what the government is providing for you. The number one program um, that I would ask you to pay attention to would be the Technology Assessment Program. So FedDev Ontario provided about $5 million of funding to an industry association called the Canadian Manufacturer Exporters. This allows 175 applications to be approved in southwestern Ontario. And the approach is to engage in a vendor of your choice um, where they can come in and do gap analysis and an assessment on how could you use technology differently, how could you collect data differently to improve productivity. Um, it's really around exactly those things that Mo shared with you, scrap reduction, improvement in downtime, um, labor productivity improvements, OEE improvements as well. So this money, this fund just really opened on April 1st. The application forms just went live in the last five to six days. Um, you can go to the website and you can see a number of vendors already listed as quality service providers, um, but don't be concerned. You can still do an application with vendors that are not listed as a QSP. This is open where they want the Canadian manufacturers to make the vendor selection on the right vendor of choice for your project. So for me, this is really phase one of any project. If you're below 500 employees, it gives you the ability to have a $25,000 non-repayable grant, and it's 100% funding. Um, so you can't start your project until you're approved. Um, they estimate on their website that it's about four to six weeks to get approved. Um, so if you want to or choose to work with us, then we'll review your quote from your vendor, and then we'll write this uh, 12 to 15 page application and stay by your side until you get approved. Another program that I want to put in front of you, which could include using services like um, the Internet of Company, um, Internet of Things Company is around AVEN. If you're in this infrastructure, if you're looking at autonomous vehicles, um, uh, electric um, hybrid vehicles, there's some great money here for you to bring different partners together 
in order to look at um, different transformative approaches. We can make a lot of um, arguments that collecting data, looking at predictive analytics is very new and very transformative. So any of those activities fit very well under the ABIN program. So this is provincial funding. It's still available. You can do a small 12-month project um, with up to $100,000 of grant funding, or you can do a much larger scale with a maximum of a million dollars. Uh, incorporated too into an R&D strategy is around IRAP. And here you can uh, support 80% of your payroll costs to work um, on a, a project that has technical risk and uncertainty. And I think the biggest trend that I've seen in government funding is a lot of people say to me, product development is R&D work. Where the government is taking you is to make sure that you understand process development is equally as important. And it, when, it, when it comes to digital transformation, it is about process development and re-engineering your workflows and your data um, completely different than you ever have before. And I really believe in the last 12 months, it's now become quite affordable to do so. So when you choose a government program, you'll see a lot of these programs are gonna be stamped with a technical readiness level. And that's really where these definitions come from, from the government. So some of our programs are gonna have a TRL level of three to seven. Others are going to be at the piloting stage of seven to nine. So we'll come back to that and review your quote. Um, there are manufacturing um, R&D programs through NGEN. NGEN.ca is the website that you wanna to go to. Again, additional R&D money. So we can um, evaluate as to what is your relationship, what, it, what are you trying to do, how much of it is um, production improvement versus how much of it is um, research and development related. When it comes to hiring, I wanted to um, make sure that you're aware of what the hiring programs look like from the government because Often what I hear back as we're working on projects together is, Bernadine, it's a time issue. I want to do these priorities, but I don't have enough time. And um, I, I therefore want to share some secrets with you so that some of my fastest growing clients are taking advantage of the hiring incentives. And the reason for that is that your senior um, project managers can download work to more junior people and then you have the ability of these junior hires to accept some of the administration work in order to allow your key people to work with most team. So in this case, you're hiring intern students for a period of eight to 16 weeks. You're hiring young grads, zero to three years at a school, and then you're freeing up your engineering team um, and your senior maintenance crew to work um, on digital transformation and predictive maintenance um, um, projects. So you can see here the money. Um, you're awarded five to $7,000 for every student that you hire, and then 50% of the salary for young grads. And if you need top technical skills as to um, looking at how you become a leader of using um, a lot of these templates that um, Internet of Things will make available to you, I think one of the strengths of the Internet of Things is they do give you the capabilities to adopt the execution and the implementation strategies sooner than other companies are able to do that for you. So if you want to hire your talent, you can truly manage the whole process of digital transformation on your own. This here just shows you that when you do, if you do want to hire people, you find your candidate, you send out, um, you select your candidate, you send out your employment agreement, just stagger the start date by seven to 10 days, which will allow us enough time to get you approved. And that's what's most critical. None of these funding programs can be started until you get approved up front. So you saw um, Mo highlighted very quickly about his training program, Internet of Things Academy, and what is their um, curriculum and online training program to allow you to extend that knowledge transfer to your team. Um, if we were going to work on that aspect of the project, we would encourage you to be aware of the Canada-Ontario Job Grant. It's going to fund 83% of the cost of a training plan for you to um, encourage the training and knowledge transfer 
of skills to your operational team. So it's a huge um, cost burden in order to train your team members. And this is what the government is encouraging you to do. And they want you to hire a third party because the government believes that you can grow faster, quicker, and better than you can by doing in-house training. So the program of choice from the province is Canada Ontario Job Grant. From the federal side, um, the federal government gives you the option of using third party vendors as well as your in-house catalyst or your champions to do the training efforts. Usually it's a combination of both. And the advantage of the federal money from FedDev Ontario is that I can incorporate your payroll costs into that program. So that would then encourage up to $100,000. It might be $25,000 a spend with a third party, and then $75K of your payroll costs might be the final outcome of funding. When it comes to um, technology, hardware, adding robotics, and really uh, scaling um, with some of the direction that you receive from your assessment grant from Mo. Then you're going to get into how do I fund this capital equipment and how do I upgrade some of my blind spots in the facility, in the production facility. These are the two programs that we're going to come back to and we're going to stack them together. We're going to get 25% funding from the federal government through BSP as long as it's innovative and it's allowing you to commercialize and scale your production. And then to that, we add the innovation initiatives that you have under the provincial program, which is SWADIF. And you can see that by stacking together, um, it will help accelerate your growth. Now, there are some restrictions on that provincial program, SWADIF, and I just want to remind you that certain regions of Toronto are excluded from applying, and we'll work through that with you depending upon your location. So that's another element of government funding is that some uh, regional restrictions may apply. And that's the example here of this program that I'm putting in front of you called CEDD. It's more suited for rural regions. So if you're in areas that have less than $100,000, 100, less than 100,000 100, people that de um, population density, then CEDD would be the program of choice. So there's just a lot of factors that you have to take into account when you're doing program selection. The other program that really aligns well with the approach that uh, Mo takes is this new program called the Ontario Automotive Modernization Program. You will see a release from the provincial government here shortly on another intake. The last intake was in November. We expect another intake to open shortly. And what it's going to do is fund you with phase two of your project. So phase one is the assessment stage, which is the TAP program. Phase two is the consulting, implementation, execution. And the advantage of the OAMP program is we can add in hardware and software costs in order to help you. So you saw Mo talk about his um, um, predictive analytics software, PDX um, software, then that could be part of your project here. Um, as well as some machines will require additional hardware to be incorporated. All of this then would be funded at a 50% contribution up to 100K grant. So um, out of all the programs that will support you moving you to Industry 4.0, OAMP would be one of the strongest programs. I'm going to skip over this um, based on timing. I want to save enough time um, for the questions. But the last program that I will leave you is a program with regards to market expansion. And if you're looking at money um, of how to respond to your challenges to grow and diversify and expand into the US, then uh, during the times of COVID, this program has gotten a significant revamp and it's $75,000 grant money up to 75% um, percent contribution. And it will support consulting, uh, market research, and um, online uh, marketing automation, search engine optimization for you to grow and maybe diversify into new market segments internationally. So the only requirement is to be aware of the regions. And as long as you have less than 10% of total revenue in any one region, 
then that is a good market for you to do projects around. So the U.S. is cut up into four regions now, so we can really look at your efforts in the U.S. and decide how you want to grow. So before I go back to the questions um, on uh, the chat line, I just wanted to summarize for you the importance of seeing how uh, your approach um, to government is going to be adopted. So the assessment is very much the TAP program. When it comes into the design, consulting, hardware um, stage, then we're going to focus really quite heavily on the OAMP program as an example. We're going to layer in some training money to ensure that the delivery model is sustainable to you at the end of a project or at the end of a cell. And that's the beauty of this model is that you could basically repeat and reuse this model every 12 to 18 months with a government program. So start small, select two or three cells, and then um, get addicted to this model and then reuse those top three or four funding programs every 18 month cycle. And it's a very solid strategy to help you differentiate. Um, everything that I shared with you is definitely on our government funding uh, website. Make sure you sign up for our e-newsletter. E and um, I just put here very quickly some of the additional webinars that we have available to you for you to join us. Um, so I think at this point, I'm going to uh, leave the PowerPoint deck um, there are um, assessments that we'll make about whether or not you're suitable to use one program compared to another. And I'm certainly happy to have a discovery phone meeting with you afterwards so that you can make sense of uh, why I, I selected the top eight or ten programs that I did. Here's our contact information in front of you. Um, Mo has representation here in the Toronto area and the coordinates are uh, up in front of you to allow you to reach out to him. So let's look at the questions here that are coming in. Um, uh, Mo, one of the questions is around software. Is the PDX software um, um, part of your toolkit or, or how do you reference what software templates and tools you offer to clients when they're going through um, the analysis stage? Yeah, that's a good question, Bernadine. Um, so we conduct our digital transformation assessment in an unbiased way. Um, we assess the client needs and we make recommendations on different tools. Um, so yes, PDX is our software product. Uh, we would recommend it for the, for the purpose of predictive analytics. But if we feel that the client uh, may require uh, another solution, a different solution, an OEE, MES type of solution, uh, we would uh, give an unbiased assessment and recommendation to the client. Okay. So how do they get started, Mo, if they have very little of an infrastructure in place? You know, what efforts are required from the business side to really get the results from that proof of value approach that you have? Yeah, on the infrastructure side, there there are a variety of ways we uh, we mitigate things and and we help set up a cost benefit analysis um, during the assessment. Uh, for example, if you have uh, older machines on the factory floor, um, we have very affordable hardware units. Uh, I'm talking three hundred dollars per machine that can that can capture data from the asset. So that's very uh, very affordable. Um, on the uh, on the server side and the IT infrastructure side. You know, our solutions are cloud-based, so you don't have to maintain your own, uh, you know, expensive infrastructure. You can use cloud-based solutions that are all subscription-based. Um, so, yeah, we have, we have a variety of means when we assess the maturity and the infrastructure level of the client. We would recommend uh, the best architecture and the best ways to, to get the customer connected. Okay. Uh, some of the questions that are coming in are related about how much time does it take for connectivity and can you achieve much in that three-day assessment period? In fact, yes. Um, it usually takes us uh, three days with an automation engineer for a factory of a moderate size. I'm talking 50 to 100 machines or assets. So three days is truly uh, ample time for our consulting team to work 
with uh, plant manager, maintenance manager, operations, continuous improvement, and then our automation uh, person to work with your controls or your um, factory uh, maintenance person to survey the machines. So it is it is ample time. We don't need everybody's time 100%. We we have a um, a phased way to do the uh, the assessment and and kind of breakout sessions that are that uh, make uh, the assessment uh, very uh, productive and efficient. And then usually within one to two weeks from the assessment date, we're able to provide the assessment results and uh, and basically the findings, the readiness level, and the recommendations around how do we get started and what technologies do I need to deploy. Okay. Yeah, there's quite a few questions coming in around the time um, and if they feel that they don't have the support from the ownership team, do you have any advice for them in that regard? Yeah, I think the people side of the coin is uh, is crucial. Maybe James, you want to say a few words about that support from the organization? Yeah, that, that's the piece where we were talking about the business case and the business objectives. And and the the, the trick here is we don't want to do this for the sake of doing it. Um, my experience, Mo's experience is if we can tie this into a specific business objective that the company already has. So if you have a business plan and you want to grow revenue by X, we have to implement Y, we have to launch product Z, whatever it is, the, the, tying it to a larger initiative within the organization will typically help generate that traction because it, it just can't be we're doing this because it's a, it's a really cool thing to do. Um, so that's typically we, but it, absent, leadership at the top i will tell you flat out getting this done and getting it done properly is 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 very very challenging and you run the risk of spending a lot of money and not getting any benefit so it's it's critical to find a way to link it and uh and get that motivation so that management management and leadership's bought in right and from my perspective on the government funding side you can really see how the government wants to work on projects where a return on investment can be clearly documented and planned out. So when I see that they're offering programs for assessment at 100% contribution for a 25K grant, that's really meant to help you evaluate and, and validate different proof of value. And I can't do anything when it comes to a government funding program without writing probably one or two pages on the ROI. So um, when you select a vendor, their ability to give you a return on investment in business cases with strong data is gonna be critical for you to win on the government funding application. So um, the government's willingness to fund these projects at 100% contribution shows you that the importance around digital transformation is significant in order to um, accelerate the Canadian economy and make these jobs um, sustainable and um, allow to create more job growth in the Ontario economy. So really why we were so passionate with a strong purpose to bring um, strong AI vendors um, like the Internet of Things company to you today and to share with you what's possible it's not as complex as we might initially think, um, but we have to have the conversations, we have to be meeting with the right vendors and having these um, uh, important conversations about how do we want to partner and how do we want to collaborate. And I can truly tell you that the government funding mix isn't um, being created anymore to encourage you to do it on your own. It's really to um, open up um, and, and collaborate and discuss what is the data that you're missing and look at options to collect it. So although you may feel that you're doing a good job 30 to 45% now effectively, there's still great ways um, for additional input to um, increase that um, the level or the technical readiness level. Uh, Mo, that was one of the most important slides that I appreciated today is understanding where are you um, on that curve and what is really your commitment and your level of readiness to really succeed. Um, and I think as leaders, we owe that to our employees. How do we 
want to uh, grow in their professional development and give them better information to make better decision making and have a greater sense of achievement every day in their jobs as well. Uh, so Mo, I think I'll end at that. Do you have any closing comments that you would like to share with the group? No, I appreciate the opportunity very much, Bernadine, uh, you know, myself and James to present here with MentorWorks. Um, I think, you know, during the current situation, uh, digital transformation and assessing your maturity and finding uh, future ways to improve, uh, this is the time. And we're glad to be partnering with you and also glad to hear there are funding opportunities to uh, get manufacturers through this initial hurdle. So we, we look forward to work with you on this topic. Thank you. That's great. Well, in respect of everyone's time, thank you so much for your commitment. And um, if there's anything we can do to help you, um, my colleague Sarah um, will send you an information package, which will include resource materials from um, both Mo and myself. And then we're happy to set up a discovery meeting with you um, outside of today's webinar. So again, um, we wish you all the best and we hope that um, we can find some positive um, value out of COVID and be open to change and be committed to do so. Take care, everyone. Look forward to seeing you out in the community soon. Bye now.